uh, Bible, remain standing. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, remain standing for our scripture reading. We'll look at just a few verses here this morning. Hebrews chapter number 4, and we're going to begin looking at, let's start in verse number, um, verse number 7. Uh, through the end of the chapter, there's 16 verses, so we'll look at beginning of verse 7. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, beginning of verse number 7. The Bible says, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you'll hear, hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not have afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged uh, sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly out of the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's bow for prayer this morning. Thank you, Father, for the Bible that you've given to us. We thank you for the scriptures that we've read this morning. And uh, Lord, now as we have these few moments together, uh, Lord, the most important part of this service is the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help me to say everything that ought to be said and help each of us to have ears to hear and uh, understanding hearts. Help us not to be disturbed and distracted, uh, no moving about, but, Lord, to allow you to speak to our hearts in a very clear and precise way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. If you would, please, our text verse for this morning is found in verse number 16. Verse number 16 of Hebrews chapter 4, where the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Four words in this verse uh, sum up all that uh, has been read in these few verses that we've looked at. And those four words are this, the throne of of grace the throne of grace now a throne normally speaks of power it speaks of authority it speaks of a place of judgment uh, it speaks of a place of accountability when you stand before that judge or that throne it's a place of authority grace on the other hand conveys that idea of sympathy understanding and uh, a love that you have uh, for that individual. And so we see what seems to be a contradiction. We have the throne, not of God. We don't have the throne of judgment. We have the throne of grace. The throne of grace. And uh, it's where uh, you've got the judgment of God and the justice of God and the authority of God. And then you've got the grace, the mercy, and or the grace and the sympathy and the compassion of God. And, and so these two thoughts are combined in Jesus Christ. He's a man of infinite power, but yet complete uh, in uh, grace for all of us. There's no authority or power in a throne in of itself, but that which sits upon, or he that sits upon that throne, is that which gives authority. And so the book of Hebrews refers to the throne of Jesus Christ multiple times, but in verse 16 we find the only place in the Bible where the throne of grace is mentioned the throne of grace. I've entitled the message this morning where the place of judgment becomes a place of comfort. Where the place of judgment becomes a place of comfort. As we look at this topic of grace, there's a lot of 
misunderstandings in this area of grace. A lot of people do not properly have a, a grasp of what grace truly is about. And I think it's because of a lack of teaching and preaching of the Word of God. But uh, we see many that believe that grace, uh, as we're in the age of grace, and we understand that God is a gracious God. But oftentimes people use that phrase, grace, that we're under grace, and we have a license to sin. We can do whatever we want to do. Uh, the, uh, the, the right to do what you want to do is not tied to grace, it's tied to your free will. And I can do whatever I want to do if I will to do it. Uh, and, uh, and grace is not that scapegoat or that uh, escape route of where I have a license to sin because we're all under grace. And uh, yes, we're under the grace of God, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Nowhere in the Bible is it taught that grace gives us the license to sin. In fact, the Bible teaches quite the opposite. We're going to be remain here in Hebrews, but I want you to just uh, flip over just briefly the book of Titus, and it's just back, um, uh, just a couple of books. If you're in Hebrews, just go back a, a book or two, and uh, you'll find Titus, and uh, look in Titus chapter 2, beginning of verse number 11, as we look at this um, air of believing that grace allows people to live a life of sin or gives them a license to sin. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, for the grace of God that bring us salvation, hath appeared to all men. Aren't you glad you're saved by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, but the gift of God? Not of works, Ephesians tells us, lest any man should boast. So our salvation is brought to us by the grace of God. By the way, grace means that God gives to me what I don't deserve. That's heaven. Mercy is that which God doesn't give me that I do deserve, and that's hell. And so the grace of God and the mercy of God are both contingent upon my salvation. So he says, the grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared to all men. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't just set aside a few and say, okay, you're going to get saved and you're not. God wants all of us to be saved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, any of us, believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, but it goes on teaching us that denying, notice what grace teaches us, that denying all uh, ungodliness, denying God ungodliness and worldly lust, we should be what? Live soberly, righteously, and God in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's clear from this verse here, verses, that the grace of God not only does not teach uh, that uh, we have a license in, but it teaches us that we're to deny uh, ungodliness and worldly lust, and also he says to live soberly and righteously and godly. And so the emphasis that grace allows you to live a life of sin is not that, it's the grace of God and understanding the grace of God that will motivate you to live a godly life and a righteous life and to live a sober life and a life that wants to honor God and please God. It's not the grace that will dilute that. It's a grace of God that will motivate us to do so much more for God. And so the lack of understanding of grace uh, is oftentimes uh, portrayed in our pulpits today and people leave thinking that we're under grace so I can do whatever I want to do. No, you have a free will. You can do whatever you want to do. Under the grace of God, God expects so much more of us. Uh, the Bible talks about under the law, uh, God says uh, uh, if uh, you have hatred to someone that, uh, that you should be put to death. But under the grace of uh, God says, um, uh, if you murder someone, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if uh, you murder someone, you should be put to death. But under grace, it says, if you have hatred towards someone, that, uh, that that's wrong. Uh, under the Old Testament law, it says, if you commit adultery, that's wrong. Under grace, it says, if you think lust in your heart, you commit adultery. So God expects so much more of us under grace, not less of us because of grace. And so, but there's a, a, much, a, a misunderstanding there about grace. And so we're talking about the three throne of grace, the throne of grace, where the place of judgment becomes a place of comfort. It's clear here as we look at Scripture that this verse is one of the greatest verses in the Bible that deal with prayer and uh, the, the access that we have to God in prayer. Though it never mentions the word prayer, prayer is very much understood and it certainly is implied in these verses. Prayer is one of the most valuable gifts 
that we receive from God the Father that allows us to have access to God. I'm glad that I don't have to show up at 5350 Pembroke Drive and the doors have got to be open. I'm going to come down the altar and meet God in prayer. I'm glad I don't have to go to a geographical place or meet with a certain type of person to interact with God. Wherever I am and wherever you are, you have constant contact with God. Everywhere you go, God is there. Want to have a fellowship and relationship with you. And so God says, I want to be able to give you a gift called prayer that, uh, that fast pass, if you would. Uh, when you go to an amusement park, you wait in line, and you wait in line, and you wait in line, but you can get that fast pass. It costs a little bit more money, uh, but you get that fast pass. That gives you a different line, and you bypass all the peons, you know, waiting in line there. And uh, you get to get in front of the line, you skip the line, and uh, you get in the front, and God said, listen, I'm giving you something called prayer. It's a fast pass. You don't have to wait in line to talk to God. You don't have to wait in line to ask your petition to God. You go straight to God and say, God, here I am. It's a gift. Prayer is that gift that God gives to us. And so God has opened the door to his throne room through Jesus Christ. And he invites us in the presence of God. And he promises to hear us and uh, answer our prayers as we pray according to his will. But why? Why is it called a throne of grace? A throne of grace, that doesn't seem like it, it, it goes, should go together. Throne, authority, throne, uh, uh, judgment, throne, you know, that position uh, there. And grace, uh, it doesn't seem like that matches why a throne of grace. I want you to notice, first off, the access that we have to this throne of grace. Look at our verse here, and uh, go back to Hebrews, if you would, please, if you're back in Titus. But go to Hebrews chapter 4 and look at number, uh, verse number 16. The Bible says, Let's therefore... Come boldly. I want you to look at that little phrase. Let us therefore come. That word come. The picture that is painted here uh, is the office of a high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest would go uh, once a year into the tabernacle and uh, he would go into this curtain. There would be this curtain that would divide the holy place from the holy of holies. The holy of holies was where the ark of the covenant was and the cherubims were there. He would go in once a year and he'd take the blood that was taken from the brazen altar and all the way through the process they would go through. He would take the blood from the basin and he would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the lid of the tabernacle. That's all it was. Uh, you see, the only way you have access to God is because of the mercy of God. And that mercy of God allows us to approach God. And that veil would be closed. The high priest would go in under the Holy of Holies, sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat, upon the ta- on the altar there, and uh, for forgiveness and atonement of sins uh, for the people of God. The restrictions in the Holy of Holies were so rigid that death was imminent if they were not met. In fact, the high priest would have a rope tied about him and uh, if uh, at any time he went in and violated any of the guidelines and prerequisites and the requirements that God had placed upon the high priest and died instantly there in the Holy of Holies, no one would be allowed to have gone in and got him. So the rope would have been tied to him so they would then be able to pull him out to not be able to access themselves the Holy of Holies to go and get the high priest. So it was a very, very strict guidelines to go in there. They had access, these priests would have, high priests priest would have access to God, the presence of God. This is where the Shekinah glory, this is where the presence of God was there in the Holy of Holies. But now we have access to the presence of God. You see in Mark chapter 13, 15, verse 38, the Bible says, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. You see, uh, that temple veil was rent when Jesus died on the cross. That temple that separated us, mankind from God, was torn asunder because the high priest no longer was needed to go before God on your behalf. We now have a high priest that cannot be touched, uh, that can be touched with the infirmities that we bear. And uh, he oversees and surpasses all other human interventions. We go through Jesus Christ, have access to the God, the Father, and that veil was torn asunder because there's nothing else that prevents us from going to God, the Father, except through Jesus Christ, through the high priest that we have access to God. He's the one as our high priest that forgives sin. No priest in this world, no pastor in this world, no priest in this world can absolve you of your sins and forgive you of your sins. Only Jesus, the high priest. Why? Because he went to the cross. He paid the sin debt. His blood was shed. He earned the right 
to be able to forgive the sins of you and I as mankind. And so the access that we had to the throne of God, God said, I want you to, to come unto me. And, and so now we can enter the Holy of Holies anywhere and anytime through the process of prayer. And that God said, I want you to come into this holy place, this holy of holies, and that you don't have to make an appointment. Uh, it's not going to be kicked out several weeks or several months like a doctor appointment. We're going to wait and wait and wait. You go to God. He's there. Come unto me. He says, come on in. And at any time, open door policy. And so he's not going to force, though, his life into your life. He's not going to force his way into your way. That's why he says, I want you just to come. I just want you to say, the door's open. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. God won't force you to go his way. He won't force you to follow on, but he'll give an invitation. Oh, it'll be a great journey. It'll be a great course of life. You'll enjoy living the Christian life, but you got to follow. Follow me and I'll make you fish with them. Come on in, pray. And he says, if you do your part, God says, boy, the blessings are waiting for us. So the access uh, to the throne of grace. He said, I just want you to come. I want you to enter into my presence. But I want you to notice the approach they were to have to the throne of grace. Uh, in the same verse, it says, let us therefore come what? Boldly. Boldly. Now, the word boldly, it doesn't mean uh, arrogantly or proudly or irreverently. It doesn't mean you come in, just sort of throw your weight around and say, God, it's about time. I got my rights. I, I expect you to do this. It's not talking about a boldness, uh, which is just a, a defiant spirit or a, a rebellious type of proudful heart. Rather, the word boldly uh, is a word meaning freedom in speaking and unreservedness in speech, openly, frankly, without concealment. You see, God is not impressed with the flowery words uh, that we might say in our prayers. He's saying, listen, uh, when you come to me, I want you to come boldly. I want you to be honest. I want you to share your heart. I want you to speak what's on your heart. I want you to speak what's in your mind, always reverent towards God, always honoring God, but not afraid to tell God what's on your heart. He said, I want you to come boldly. I want you to share what's going through your mind, what's going through your heart as you deal with with the issues of life. And so he wants honesty. He wants honesty. Look in your Bibles, if you would. Go to Psalm 51, verse 6. Yeah, it's amazing to me. Uh, God knows us anyway, uh, but yet uh, we want to have these flowery prayer prayers to God as though we're trying to impress God how spiritual we are and how righteous we are. God knows how unspiritual we are and says, listen, it's time just to get honest with God and come clean with God and let God see the honesty in our part. In Psalm, we see this told as we approach the throne of grace. God said, I want you to come boldly. Freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech. Here it is, Psalm 51 and verse number six. It says, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Notice what he says. He says, God desires what? Truth in the inward parts. He says, you know what? You may be able to put a facade up on the outside. You may be able to fool everybody else around you. Everybody else may think you're this wonderful Christian, this wonderful woman of God, this wonderful man of God. He said, but listen, I want you to come clean. I want you to be honest. I want you to have the inward heart to be truthful. God's looking for someone that's real on the inside and shows them what's really on the inside as you come to God boldly truthfully unto God. I'm not trying to impress God with your big words and your, your wonderful accolades of prayer, but a truthful, honest heart. And so the word boldly uh, was used in ancient time, uh, as we said a moment ago, to ref refer to a freedom of speech. It normally depicts a person who speaks his mind and who does it straightforwardly and with great confidence. In the New Testament times, freedom of speech was restricted. And people who violated the rules were punished. You weren't allowed just to say anything you were thinking. You weren't allowed just to verbalize anything that was on your heart or on your mind. There would be punishment as a result of that. And so the word boldly depicts a frankness that was so bold, it was often met with resistance, hostility, and opposition. It just wasn't acceptable to speak so candidly. And God says, that's how I want you to come to God. I want you to come to me and speak boldly. I want you to be candid. I want you to be frank. I want you to have freedom of expression to God. 
I want you to be able to share that. Listen, we'd have a lot less complaining to others. If you'd be honest with God, you'd have a lot more uh, uh, honesty with God. You wouldn't be griping and complaining and murmuring to everybody else, but you're so afraid to go to God and be honest and tell God what you're really thinking, what you're really feeling. God said, why don't you come to the throne bold? Throne of grace, what? Boldly. Tell God what's on your mind. Tell God in those areas. And such outspokenness in Bible times was often a time of rebuke and, and oftentimes punishment. But the Holy Spirit uses this word boldly. It tells us several important things. Number one, you know that whenever we approach the Lord in prayer, we need to make sure not to fear that we're too frank, too bold, too forthright, too honest, too outspoken, or even too blunt to bear hearts to God and request God to listen. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what's on your heart. Tell me. Reveal it to God. Well, one of the greatest ways to heal is have a venting place. Have a place and God is big enough and God is good enough and God is powerful enough to allow you to vent on Him in times of prayer instead of taking all your frustration and venting on everybody else and poisoning everyone else through your frustrations. You go to God and go boldly. And so we should never be irreverent, as I said a moment ago, but neither do we need to be ashamed to speak exactly what's on our heart. You see, when you go to the Lord, He wants to hear exactly what you have to say. He already knows anyway. He already knows what's on your heart. So tell Him. I just don't think this is fair. Well, tell God that then. I don't think this is right. All right, well, tell God that. Now, you've told your co-workers that. You've told your family that. You tell everybody else that. Why don't you tell God that? God's the one that says, come boldly and be frank. Be honest with God when you go to God in prayer. Secondly, the use of the word boldly, uh, as used here, gives us the encouragement to speak boldly to God in prayer that tells us that God will not rebuke us for telling him exactly what we think. Now, he may correct us through his word. And to help us fix our wrong thinking and our wrong believing. But God is always glad to hear from us as we come boldly to God. And since God hears what's on my mind, hears what's on my heart, and I'm sharing it with you. And God then can begin to refunnel or reshape or redirect some of that thing. Because a lot of times as we communicate... We're not, th- we're not communicating rightly. We're not thinking rightly. Our thinker might be broken. Our thinker might not be as accurate. And so we can do that with God. And it doesn't affect God in our relationship with God. Because God said, I want you to be frank. Be honest. What, what, what's going on? What, what don't you like about what's going on in your life? And uh, God said, I'm, I'm okay hearing that. And uh, let, let's, let, let's just tell me what that is. And God's not mad at you. Uh, God knows that we're but flesh. God knows that we're human. God says, tell me what's on your heart. Come boldly to God. So we see the access to God. We see the approach unto God. But I want you to also notice here, uh, as uh, we look at the assurance of the throne of grace. Uh, look what it says. It says, I want you to come boldly. Verse 16, let us therefore come. That's the invitation, all right? Uh, he's not going to force his way in yet. Uh, he wants you to oh, come on in the door. The door's there. Come on in. He wants you to come boldly. He wants you to come with frankness of speech. He wants you to be able to be honest. Quit, quit, quit throwing out the flowery uh, conversation. Be honest with God and to tell God how you're really feeling. And then uh, look at the third thought, the assurance of this throne of grace, that we may obtain, that we may obtain uh, mercy and then find grace Obtain mercy and find grace. You see, we don't have to fear ever being turned away because of what you've said to God. Now, others may turn you away because of what you say to them, but God will never turn you away because of what you say to Him. By the way, much of what we say to others should never have been said to them. It should have been said to God. It should have been said. That's, what, that's one of the things about prayer. Prayer is not just, all right, God, uh, here's what I want. I want, I want, I want. We talked about this morning, the intercessory prayer and persistent prayer and praying for others. And much of our prayer time should be for others. But God also said, a part of our communion with God, our communication with God, is just taking the frustrations you have and laying them at the feet of the cross and tell God about them. And let God be your venting post. Not your wife, fellas. Not your husband, ladies. Uh, not your co-workers, employee, uh, not your fellow church member, church member, God. What's the last time you took your frustrations and disappointments and things to God and just laid them out there? Uh, your, your, your laundry, if you would, and laid them out to God. And so God's not going to turn you away. He says, you're going to obtain and you're going to find. It doesn't say that you might obtain. It doesn't say you'll look for it but, but not find it. It says may obtain and will find. I'm grateful that my Heavenly Father will never turn me away. I may not feel worthy to approach Him, but He'll never turn me away. 
I may not feel deserving to be able to enter into that holy of holy presence, but he'll never. The Bible says, draw nigh to me. And God says what? I'm going to draw nigh to you. But I want to know that you want to come close to me before I come closer to you. I want to be able to know your heart intent uh, as you make it uh, visible in your actions. Uh, God didn't turn me away at the time of my salvation. John 6, 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. It doesn't matter how far in sin you've gone. It doesn't matter how wicked your life past may have been. God said, listen, all that come to me, I will no wise cast Listen, that was some of us. That was each and every one of us. They were on a wrong path, going down a wrong road, and we found out about our hope in Jesus Christ, and we came to Jesus Christ if you come to me, I'll give you a home in heaven. I'll give you forgiveness of sins. I'll give you a fresh start. I'll give you a new beginning. I'll give you a purpose for which to live your life. I'll give you a renewed life. God said, but if you got to come, you got to do your part. And when we do our part, God says, here's the benefit. Here's the blessings. It's going to be a result of that. So he didn't turn me aside when I came to salvation. And God also doesn't turn me away at the time of my supplication. So Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, I say unto you, ask, it shall be given to you. See, you shall find, knock, it shall be open to him. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. Him that knocketh, it shall be open. The word obtain can be translated a couple of ways now, depending on how you use it in the text. For example, it can mean to seize, to lay hold of something in order to make it your very own. Almost like a person that reaches out to grab, to capture, to take possession of something, to obtain. Now, the truth is this. Jesus is willing, that, that word almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Jesus, as we know, is willing uh, to give us and provide and supply what we need. He wants to. He tells us, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy given. I will give you rest and uh, take my yoke upon. Learn, God wants to meet your need. So what do we have to obtain for? What is it that we're laying hold of and grabbing onto? Sometimes, uh, as a Christian, sometimes there's exterior forces that seem to be pulling us in countless different directions. And they take a deliberate act on your part to shove away the external pulls out of the way and reach out by faith and lay hold of what God has for you. There's all kinds of temptation, but you got to lay hold to obtain it. They're trying to distract you. They're trying to cause you to be detoured. But you got to fight for what God has for you and Obtain it. God says there might be some resistance trying to prevent you from getting something that God wants to give you. But you've got to obtain it. Grab it. Go after it. Don't allow the distraction. Lay hold on it. Take it. Make it your own so you can receive what? The mercy of God in that situation. Then we see the word find. Uh, is the idea of discovery that's made by searching. It's an intense investigation, scientific study, scholar, scholarly uh, research. There's nothing of chance led to the investigation here. Uh, after working long hours and searching extensively, you found it. You found it. It's like someone they're looking for something, and you shout out, Eureka! Eureka! What's that? I found it! I found it! Listen, God says, I want you to come boldly to the throne of God so you can obtain and find what you're needing to live a successful life. I found it! Eureka! God said, I want you to have that, that diligence, that determination, that boldness, that courage, that persistency to march on and lay hold, grab it, hold it as your own, and God says, you'll find it. And so the word doesn't, though, just describe making it or holding it for yourself. It also means acquiring something for someone else. It means you go to Jesus, the great high priest, to seek help from him on behalf of others. And I won't go into the, the, that thought today as we took a good 30 or 40 minutes today in Sunday school talking about the uh, importunity, the parable of uh, the persistent uh, neighbor that went to get bread uh, for a friend that visited him at midnight. And he, he gave him his bread, not because he was a friend, though they were friends, but he gave him his bread because of what? His persistence, his importunity. He wouldn't give up. He kept knocking. He kept knocking. He wouldn't back down. He kept moving forward. He wasn't going to stop following on. The breeze is washed out. The trails are uh, put aside, but he's following on. He's knocking going to stop. He's marching on. And so uh, we see the persistence there. But notice now the assumption of the throne of grace that we may obtain and find what? Obtain mercy. Mercy, the unspoken assumption here of every child of God at the throne of grace is the importance of mercy. Isn't it interesting? You have to go to the throne of grace to get mercy. Now think of that. Mercy is not receiving what I don't, what I do deserve. Mercy. That's hell. Mercy is me not receiving what I deserve. Grace is receiving something 
that I don't deserve. I have to go to grace, the place to get something I don't deserve, to be given mercy to not get something I do deserve. Isn't it amazing the power of grace? You go to the throne of grace to get what? The mercy that you and I as a child of God need to say, God, don't give me what I deserve. I don't want my rights. I don't want what's deserving of me. I want your mercy, God. When a, when a prisoner stands before a judge, he doesn't stand there a shackled and stand before the judge and says, I want my rights. I want justice to be served. He says, God, mercy, would you judge, would you be merciful? Would you be merciful? Don't give me a verdict that I deserve. Be a little bit merciful to me. When we go before God, God says, you're going to come to the throne of grace, authority, grace. And God says, you're going to go to the place to get something you don't deserve, to give you something you do deserve, called mercy. So I'm going to give you mercy at the throne of grace. And so the believer today is in constant need of the mercy of God. Lamentations 3 says that it is of the Lord's mercies that are we not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I don't know about you, but every morning you wake up, God's got a whole new container overflowing with mercy. They're new every morning. You can't wear out the mercies of God. Oh, we emptied it out yesterday, didn't we? We emptied out the day before. Every day the mercy container is gone. It's bone dry. But listen, every day you wake up, God says, I know you're going to have some things that you don't deserve and things that you ought to deserve that should come down your way. You don't deserve the answer to prayer. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve that. You do deserve this. You do deserve that. And God said, my mercy, it's new every morning. Uh, we see in 1 Peter, it says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Uh, we need the mercy of God. And uh, we are not consumed. Why? Because of the mercy of God. Uh, aren't you glad that we're not God? Because if we were God, we'd zap the rest of us. There'd be none of us here. If I was God, I'd zap you. You'd be poof gone. If you were God, you'd zap the rest of us. Poof, we'd all be gone. None of us would be here. But God is God. Thank the Lord for that. And His mercy, His mercy uh, is new every morning. And it never runs out, never runs dry. Notice now the awareness here of the throne of grace. The Bible says to help in time of need. To help in time of need. This awareness of the throne of grace of every believer is very serious. And uh, prayer is very universal. You see, you can't approach the throne of grace without one key ingredient. You got to know that you need help. You don't need the throne of grace if you don't need help. There's one prerequisite to be able to approach this throne of grace. It's a need for help. You see, we all have needs. Those needs are never more evident than when you're spending time in God in prayer. You see, you go to God because of needs in prayer. But while you're meeting with God, asking God to meet those needs in prayer, God, through prayer, begins to reveal the needs that you have in your own personal life that only God can meet. He's not, at, he's not talking about what you're asking for. He's talking about the things that you're not even aware of. You think you need this. But your mom and dad says, no, you don't need cookies for breakfast and lunch and dinner and donuts. You need vegetables and you need, a, you know, you need your milk. And you, need your, you, know, you need all these different things. And so we go to God and says, God, here's what I need. And the more you spend time telling God what you need, that time in prayer begins to allow God to reveal the true needs of your heart. There's no greater awareness of needing help than when you go to God in prayer. There's not a time when I don't have a need for God's grace. You can't enter the throne of grace without the realization of your needs being clear. I think a main reason we don't pray is that we don't realize how needy we are. How much did we pray this week? How much time was given to prayer? We gave as much time to prayer as we felt that we needed God. If we didn't pray, we says, God, I've got this covered. I don't need you. I've got it. Everything's okay. Family's good. Bills are paid. This is good. That's good. I don't need you. Uh, we think we can handle things on our own. You know the church at Laodicea, what was said of them? It said they had need of nothing. You know what that tells me about the church at Laodicea? They were a non-praying church because they didn't realize they had needs. They had need of nothing. 
How you doing? You have any needs? Oh, no, I'm good. You have no needs. You're either a liar or you're not spending time in God in prayer because God will reveal to the various needs that we truly have in our lives. So if I'm not praying, it reveals I don't think I have a need for God. And prayer is nothing more than God's involvement in my life. Don't you want God? Don't we want God involved in our life? Don't we need God involved as a husband, fellas, to be the right kind of husband to lead and to guide and direct our wife and be the right role model and the right example that we can point in the right direction? Ladies, don't you need God in your life as a wife to be able to uh, be a help and support and to help oversee the family? And don't we as a mom and dad, don't we need God's help in rearing those kids for God? Don't we need God's involvement in our life? Don't we need God? And our lack of praying says, God, I'm good. I don't need you in this area of my life. And I wonder if God brings needs into our life to help us realize how much we need him. I wonder if we we just prayed knowing we need God, if there would be less needs in our life to reveal to us how much we really needed God. Now let's look at this phrase here, a help in a time of need. I'm almost through help in a time of need. The phrase is a military uh, thought, which adds much more meaning and makes it much more powerful in this thing of help in time of need. It was a military word that beckoned soldiers to battle. I like this when I was studying it. Uh, if you were a Marine, uh, you'll, you'll sort of identify with this. I'm sure it went across the board to all the militaries, but uh, this thing of, of Marine, their slogan of, of faithful faithfulness and always faithful uh, goes with that but the military word beckons soldiers to battle it was a word that depicted listen now the exact moment when a soldier heard that his fellow soldier was entrenched in battle captured or struggling once alerted the situation the soldier quickly went to into battle to fight for the safety and the well-being of his fellow fighter for that soldier just hearing of a fellow soldier in need was all that was necessary to beckon him into battle he spared no effort to deliver his brother as he went to action to rescue him and bring him back to a place of safety security and protection and that's what the spirit of God tells us in this word when you get into trouble and uh, you tell Jesus about it listen you don't have to fight your own battles you don't have to battle yourself you go to God in prayer and when you go to God in prayer that military return they'll find help in time of need then Jesus comes to your aid as a fellow soldier and he takes up the battle he takes up the war he begins to fight your fight he begins to fight that battle for you through prayer he comes up alongside of you and prays and battles that prayer through prayer he comes and battles for you You see, if we go to battle for you and fight for you, then he'll deliver you. But if exterior forces seem to be pulling in and you don't call on God, then God's going to miss the opportunity through absence of prayer to be a part of your life. This kind of need Jesus wants to provide will present your needs to him by faith. We don't have to fight alone. You don't have to fight alone. You have a warrior that's in your corner. He's won every battle. He's victorious over every uh, enemy that comes your way. But if you don't come boldly to the throne of God and obtain God and find God in a time of need, what's that time of need, God? I'm ca- say, God, I'm captured. I'm in, 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 uh, uh, enslaved. I'm in bondage. God, I need help. I'm struggling. And that soldier of the cross, Jesus Christ, shows up and he goes to fight to bat. For you and I, as a child of God, ever interceding on our behalf, fighting and interceding and battling for you and I, we don't have to fight alone as God is there with us. Why fight alone when the greatest warrior of the universe is willing to fight for you? That word help also is a nautical term, a technical nautical term that's used elsewhere. It's used in Acts chapter 27, verse 17, to describe the cables that the sailors wrapped around the hull of Paul's ship during the storm so it wouldn't break apart. And so the, the ship was beginning to be torn asunder in Acts. And uh, they began to put these cables uh, around this ship to keep it intact so it wouldn't fall apart and, and, uh, and to be destroyed and, and sink. And so we encountered the same verb in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, where it, is, uh, uh, where it says, uh, it has the, the nuance of uh, running to the aid of someone else crying for help. Where the Bible says in verse 18 of Hebrews, for he that is himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. You see, when you're 
life seems to be coming apart and it seems because of the storm cry out for a sympathetic high priest the throne of grace and he'll come in time and need to help you he'll bandage you up he'll tighten you up he'll put those cables around you of his promise of his presence of his provision of his power he'll wrap your life so you won't fall apart your life may be feeling like it's crumbling everything falling apart let God be the source of your helper come to God in prayer boldly and let God help you. A soldier in need, a ship being cracked up with the problems and trials of life. Let God undergird you in every area of your life. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly on the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is the throne of grace? It is grace enthroned. You see, grace is more than a concept. It's more than a doctrine. It's a person. It's a person. Can you help me here? We're almost done. Go to your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse number 14. What is this throne of grace? It's not a doctrine. It's not a theology. It's not uh, some concept or some philosophy. It's a person. In the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, look in chapter 1, verse number 15. The Bible says, the Word was made flesh. Now the Word, uh, if you go back to John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. So we're talking about Jesus, right? So when we see the word word there, it's a reference to Jesus. So we come down to verse 14, and it says, And the word, so we can say Jesus, And Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of his only begotten, as of the only begotten of the Father. Notice now, full of grace and truth. You don't have to compromise truth to be full of grace. As I first stated, well, you know, grace is a license of sin and light, uh, grace is just be able to live the way you want. We're under grace. You'll live the way you want to live. Don't allow someone to, to arbitrarily put all these rules and guidelines on your life. We're under grace. Listen, he says he's full of grace and what? Full of truth. So they're not opposed. They're not opposition. They're, they're together. God can have full of truth and full of grace together. So it says he's full of grace. Now, whenever you're, whatever you're full of is what's going to flow out of your life. So if a person is full of envy and bitterness and strife, when they speak, what's going to come out? Criticism, fault finding, gossip is going to flow out of their mouth. Why? Because they're full of that bitterness and antagonistic uh, resentment in their heart. But if you're full of grace, it'll flow out with edifying words of blessing and health and strength to others. You can, that's what the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know what's in someone's heart, just listen to how they talk. Listen to the way they talk. And uh, you'll know what they're full of. Uh, if they're full of sports, they're going to ooze out sports. You're going to hear about sports. If they're full of uh, you know, the politics, every time you're going to ooze out politics, and they're going to talk politics all the time. If they're full of, of God and the word of God, they're going to, you can't, it's going to overflow. They're going to talk about the things of God. You'll know what's full of, of within someone by what they talk about. Notice what now, Luke 4, take your Bible and go to Luke chapter 4. With that thought there, uh, go to Luke chapter 4, verse number 22. Now, if what we're full of is going to overflow in our conversation and what we talk about then Luke 4 tells us that people who heard Jesus marveled at the gracious words that flowed out of his mouth look in Luke chapter 4 verse 22 and all bear him witness and wonder notice now 422 and wonder they were amazed marveled at what the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and they said is not this Joseph's son is not this a carpenter's son? Is not this the son of the carpenter? You know, carpenters, they're pretty vulgar sometimes, right? Hitting their finger on a hammer and things. I mean, they're vulgar. He said, listen, is not this uh, Joseph's son? And they were marveled. They were amazed at what? How gracious his speech was. Well, that shouldn't surprise us because if whatever you're full of, it's going to be a part of your speech. And he was full of grace, we saw in John 1.14. And the Bible says because he was full of that, Luke 4.22, he overflowed. It proceeded out of his mouth was what? Gracious words. You see, Jesus is a personification of God's grace. Jesus. He's a personification of God's grace. Uh, we see that over and over in Scripture, uh, over and over. The gospel of grace 
is the gospel of Jesus. Can, can, can you help me? Well, look, look at two verses here. Let, let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're almost done. Acts chapter 20. I just want to show you that grace is the personification of Jesus. G, or Jesus is the personification of grace. It, we see Jesus manifesting grace. And we see it shown clearly in Scripture. The gospel of grace is the gospel of Jesus. Look in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count on my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus, knows down, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, sir, that little phrase there, gospel of the grace of God. Now, in the margin of your Bible, right there, I want you to write 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. 2 Thessalonians, right in the margin there of that verse, circling the gospel of grace, I want you to write down 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. And then turn over there real quick and let's, let's look what that says in regards to uh, the gospel of grace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 2 Thessalonians, let me read it to you. Ver, chapter 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that the gospel of grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not two different things. It's the same thing. It's a, exactly so Jesus Christ is a personification of God's grace. The gospel of grace and the gospel of Jesus are the same thing. We're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 2, 5, I'm sorry. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. But we're also saved by Jesus, 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose of grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Listen, I'm saved by grace, but I'm saved by Jesus. They're both the same thing, the personification of grace. We're justified by grace. Romans 3, 24, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're justified by Jesus. Uh, Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our tra offenses and was raised again for our justification. Listen, I'm justified by grace. I'm justified by Jesus. I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by Jesus. The gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, all blessings of God come to us by grace alone. All of them are found in Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He's the epitome. Jesus is the epitome of grace. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. In other words, men could not have formed an adequate conception of grace apart from the personification of Jesus. See what the verse says? It says, he bringeth salvation, hath appeared to all men. We were able to see grace firsthand. How? In Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what grace is? Just do a study of Christ. And in studying Christ, you'll have a true depth of what grace is. Know Jesus, N-O, N-O. Know Jesus, no N-O grace. Know Jesus, K-N, O W, know Jesus, and you'll know K N O W grace. You will never know grace apart from Christ. He is that manifestation of the grace of God in our life. I don't know about you today, but the throne of grace seems like a contradictory statement. That's a place of uh, authority. That's a place of power. Then you got grace. That's a place of of love and compassion and and tenderness and gentleness. How do you put those together? Oh, that's the message today, where the place of judgment becomes a place of comfort. And prayer is the key that allows you to go to that throne of grace boldly. Be honest with God. You upset with God about some things going on in your life? Tell him. Tell him. Vent on God. Vent on God. It's not doing any good keeping it on the inside. You're self-destructing. You're self-destructing. Vent to God. As you vent to God, God will hear. As you speak boldly. And God will be that help in time of need. It's obvious you need help. You wouldn't be coming boldly to God, speaking frankly to God. And God says like a soldier coming to a fellow soldier, he's going to come to your aid. Like a ship falling apart, He's going to wrap you with the cables of his love and care and compassion and presence. He's going to undergird your life and keep you from falling apart. 
It's the only hope you've got. It's the only hope you have. But what a great hope to have because a hope in the Word of God is an expectant thing that God will do in your life. It's not some wishful thinking. It's an expectancy that God's going to have. Thank you, Father, for this morning.